Good morning and blessed Sabbath to all. Uh, I want to again, uh, before I give the message to bow and to invite the Lord to be with us here again. So I'm just going to say a prayer, a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again. It is our privilege to worship you on this, your holy Sabbath day. I again invite the Holy Spirit, the holy angels in your presence to speak through me the words you've given that I may receive it and give only your words that will help to bless others with the truth for this time. I pray and ask you to continue to guide us and keep us and help us to be faithful Amen. in all that we do and say that we can glorify your name and fully reflect your character. I ask this now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So what we have here, the message as you can see on the screen is called Hears, Hears and Doers. And this is really talking about two classes of people that will be living on this earth just prior to the close of probation. Now these two classes are found in the world and they're found in the church. And we especially want to look at the two classes in the church because the preparation time for God's people is almost over. Now some people may call them the wheat and the tears. I like to call them within our church the SDA club members and the remnant who are preparing to be part of the 144,000 because you can't be a member of the SDA club. Those of you who are lifelong, longtime Adventists know that there are two distinct groups of classes in the church, but only one group is going to go through, and that's the group that's preparing to be part of the 144,000. You know, Satan's overmastering delusions are sweeping right on through Adventism, and he's gathering up a harvest of souls in his web of deception. These two groups can be really easily recognized in what we call the parable of the ten virgin and also the parable of the sower and the seed, which was presented to us, by the way, last Sabbath in a very good presentation. So we want to understand what we need to do as Christ's people to make sure that we are counted in the right group and prepared to meet our Savior when he comes to take us home. And I spoke previously in a message I gave before about how Satan has brought in his deadly counterfeit gospel, his counterfeit sanctification message right into Adventism, and it's being preached in many of our churches to directly oppose and to replace the three angels' message, which is the three angels' message is what God gave to this church to preach for this time. And this counterfeit gospel is picking up steam, and it's in a lot of our churches. You don't have to take my word for it. Just go online and you'll see preachers preaching this this counterfeit gospel. Some people call it love reality or love and unity gospel or the touchy-feely cheap grace gospel. I call it the patty cakes gospel. It's all designed to just take you out, take you out of the truth and keep you asleep until probation closes. Then it's too late. You know, I remember, and I said this before, we had visited a church in the Seattle area that was preaching this gospel. It was we were looking for a place to attend on a Sabbath, and we thought we found a place that might have a decent message. It was two, 250 people, maybe all close to 300, and we walked in there, and I thought, okay, this is a very popular church. It was packed, and the preacher's message, the preacher didn't even give him milk like this man's holding. He didn't give him anything. His gospel message was how to have fun on Labor Day. That was his message to prepare people for the second coming of Christ. But he wasn't preparing anybody. He was preparing them for the fires of hell. Uh, that, it was a disgrace. And I thought, 
You mean there's 250 people sitting here listening to this pastor give that kind of a message? It wasn't a sermon. It was just a talk about how to have a good time. And friends, this is the kind of thing that is happening. And I assure you, you don't want any part of that, any part of that counterfeit message. Um, I've heard much stronger messages in Sunday churches. I mean, this is, this is unbelievable to me. But yet, it's picking up steam, and it's in a lot of our churches today. And those of us who are doers of the word, we have a key role to play in giving the last message of mercy to this world, which is the three angels' messages. Now, let's look at our scripture text. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face, in a glass for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work this man shall be blessed in his deed so the two classes are the hearers and the doers and they're clearly defined in this scripture text. So God wants us to be both hearers and doers, not just hearers. And I want you to notice this from Australasian Union Conference record. Practical Christianity, we must have or we cannot enter heaven. Hearing and preaching the gospel is not enough. We must wear the yoke of Christ we must learn of him to be meek and lowly. And we must be what? Doers of the word. If ye know these things, Christ declares, happy are ye if ye do them. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. End quote. So a big part of this counterfeit sanctification message that has invaded many of our conference churches today and many of our other churches is what we call the cheap grace gospel. And it, that it's only what we only have to believe, that's it. And we're saved through Christ without any works whatsoever to prove whether our faith is genuine. And now it takes different forms and different titles, but it's the same message over and over again that they're giving. And this is a counterfeit satanic gospel. And the teaching that we can never be perfect is deceiving church members into believing that we actually are going to be saved in our sins. And you might remember the Pharisees in Christ's day, they, they actually practiced this hypocritical gospel that Jesus so unsparingly condemned, right? Let's turn on our Bibles, turn in there to Matthew 23, and let's look at verse 1 through 4. Matthew 23, verse 1 through 4, and I'll read it. Verse 1, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and not do, but uh, that observe and do, rather, but do not ye after their works for they say and do not for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers so friends they were perfect hypocrites they professed god with their lips right but their works really showed their true nature so they had what we call a dead faith. And these, unfortunately, modern-day Pharisees are doing the same thing, the exact opposite of what they profess. They profess Christ, but their works don't profess Christ at all. And none of us want to fall into this trap called faith without works. We have to have a living, abiding faith that actually reflects what we profess to believe let's read this from letter 55 
I do not mean that cheap faith unsupported by works, but that earnest, living, constant, abiding faith that eats the flesh and drinks the blood of the Son of God. And let's look at another quote here, Faith I Live By, 217. If an inquirer after salvation were to ask, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The modern teachers of sanctification would answer, only believe that Jesus saves you. Just believe, right? But notice what here is underlined. No value is attached to a mere profession of faith in Christ. Only the love which is shown by what? Works is counted genuine. So this is a very, very subtle and effective deception to make people say that, hey, you know what, we don't have to do anything to prove our faith uh, because God did it all, so we're just going to just float up to heaven. We don't have to make any effort on our part. And we should all know this next text by heart. It completely refutes the cheap grace gospel. Let's turn there, James chapter 2, 18 to 20. I know we all know the text. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works, is dead. And let's drop down to verses 24 to 26. Verse 24, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so Faith without works is dead also. That means it's completely dead. We have no works to show that we have a genuine faith Then we simply have a dead faith. And of course, we know that we can never earn our way into heaven by our works. It just simply shows us whether we have a true faith or we're just giving lip service like so many are today. Are we a hearer of the word of God or are we a doer of God, God's word? Unless we are doers of the word of God, it doesn't matter how much truth we go and listen to in the church on Sabbath, it's never going to profit us. We have to be in the field of action, friends. This is letter 8, 1898. If the churches who know the truth, that's us, right, and have had great labor bestowed on them are now selfish and exacting and covetous, for fear they will not have the ministry or the, of the word, it reveals that the word would not do them no real good. The word would do them no real good if they had its ministry. It says they are not prepared to be benefited by the word by becoming doers of the word. It says for, us, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but. The word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. End quote. So the question then we have to ask today is, how do we become doers of the word instead of hearers only? We must become workers to gather with God. That's the only way we can do that. To form right characters for heaven, it requires us uh, to have self-sacrifice that Unfortunately, many people are just not willing to make. And how sad that is, but it's true. It requires a persevering effort on our part in order for us to resist the powers of darkness. We have to be unselfish ministers for Christ because selfishness has no place in heaven. And this is how we develop the character of Christ by doing his works in love for one another. That's the only way, friends. Notice this. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter, and let's read verse 8 through 10. 1 Peter, verse 8 through 10. 
And just say amen when you're there. Okay. Verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. What is charity? It's love. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So friends, we all are going to have trials to go through on this earth. But God allows this in order to perfect our characters and to remove the dross from our characters. Let's drop down and read verse 12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, so we're all going to go through trials. But that is how God perfects our character. If we refuse to uh, inconvenience ourselves as do any kind of self-sacrificing work for Christ, how do we expect to be ready for heaven? Notice this, Manuscript 59. Those who gain the master over, the temp over temptation and sin will have conflict and trials to meet. For the powers of darkness are determined to oppose their advance, lest they become channels of light to the world. All the powers of the being must engage in this warfare, and while they look to the cross of Christ for grace and strength, they will surely conquer. For every soul who is growing up into Christ, there will be times of earnest and long continued struggle against the enemy but if we work the works of christ the mind will gather strength and firmness to resist the adversary of souls end quote so the key word in that last sentence is if we work the works of christ so friends there are many people today that are just looking for a shortcut to holiness and salvation they don't want to put in the work they don't want to be bothered. It's too inconvenient. I'm tired. I'm busy. I don't have time. The pleasing idea that spurious teachers in our church today are promoting to only believe in heaven is yours, that's gathered many followers that have itching ears into their ranks because it's a pleasing message. It requires no self-sacrifice, friends. The doctrine that we can be saved by believing without overcoming sin, it goes by a variety of different names today, but it's still the same old deception. So we have to be on the alert to recognize and avoid this deceptive fable and also avoid the deceivers that are promoting it. And so whether it comes to us in books or online in videos or even in person, it makes absolutely no difference. Let's turn to Titus 1, 9 to 11. Titus 1, 9 to 11. holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Who's Paul talking about here? These are people, these are Jews, people in the church, right? Whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, Teaching things they ought not, thank you, for filthy lucre's sake. So what this is really telling us is that greatest dangers are actually coming from the false teachers within, not from the outside, friends. The danger is inside the church. This is Faith and Works, page 89. From the pulpits of today, the words are uttered, believe, only believe. Have faith in Christ. You have nothing to do with the old law. Only trust in Christ. It says, how different is this from the words of the apostle who declares that faith without works is dead? He says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We must have that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. And this is important underline here. Many seek to substitute a superficial faith for uprightness of life and think 
through this to obtain salvation. What this is saying here is that they want God to conform to their desires and wishes. They want to give God the offering of Cain. They don't want to give Abel's offering, right? So notice this in great controversy. It says here, the desire for an easy religion that requires no striving, no self-denial, no divorce from the follies of the world, has made the doctrine of faith and faith only a what? It's a popular doctrine. A lot of people are eating it up right now. But what saith the word of God? And I want to say something here. There's a lot of churches that are packed, packed to the brim, with no empty seats that are preaching that gospel, friends. And it says the testimony of the word of God is against this ensnaring doctrine of faith without works. It is not faith that claims the favor of heaven without complying with the conditions upon which mercy is to be granted. It is what? Presumption. For genuine faith has its foundations in the promises and provisions of the scriptures. End quote. So, presumption is the counterfeit of faith. The reason our church is in the Laodicean state it is in today, it's not because of faith, it's because of presumption. And that's the devil's counterfeit. We truly believe that our spiritual condition as a church is far better than it actually is. Oh, the ship is going to go through. How many times have you heard that? The ship is going to go right on through. Friends, let me just explain something. The ship of apostasy is not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. The faithful souls are the ones that are going to go through. Apostasy is not going up. It doesn't matter who's preaching that. Let's look at this. As we read earlier from the pen of inspiration, the desire for an easy religion that requires no self-striving, no self-denial, no self-sacrifice, and no divorce from the evils of this world is going to keep many church members out of heaven. Because too many are traveling down the broad road to perdition because, well, it doesn't require any self-sacrifice and no, no self-denial. It's easy. There's nothing for me to do. So we have to make the decision to follow Christ wherever he leads us. We have to resist the powers of darkness if we are going to have our names registered in the book of life. Because God will give us the victory and the power to overcome if we come to him in humble obedience. Humble obedience. And we give our hearts fully to him. We can't be a split. We can't serve God and serve Bammon. We have to decide. We have to put on the whole armor of truth if we're going to win this battle. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6 and let's read verse 10 to 13. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13, and let's read verse 10 here. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand." So if we're going into battle, we're not going to go into battle with just put, well, I'll just put on this little uh, knee plate here and then I'll, I'll, the rest I'm all good. No, we're going to go into battle with all the armor. And when we try to serve God and we try to serve the world, then that's what we're doing. We're, we're in a conflicted position. We're in a daily battle uh, because the controversy between good and evil is going on. And we can't afford to relax our defenses for even a minute as this battle is reaching its climax real soon. So we have to ask, who of us is going to be victorious in this battle? And the question is, how can we perfect our characters for heaven? Well, let's look at this from Review and Herald, December 21. Character is not obtained by trying to have others fight the battle of life for us. It must be sought, worked for, fought for, and it requires a purpose, a will, a determination. 
to form a character which God will approve requires what? Persevering effort. So we can't develop characters for heaven through our spouse or our children or our relatives or the pastor or the elder or the conference leader. No, we have to do the work ourselves. It's like saying, yeah, somebody, uh, I need to eat this food, but I'll have you eat it for me. It doesn't work. We have to do it. It will take a continual resisting of the powers of darkness to stand under the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel to be approved in the day of judgment and have our names retained in the book of life. So no one else can stand for us. We have to stand for ourselves. The spirit of prophecy tells us that there might be couples where one is in heaven, the other one isn't. Each person has to stand in the judgment day uh, for our works that we've done in this life. Revelation 12:11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. When I think of Revelation 12:11, I can't help but think about the story of the three Hebrew worthies, right? It's a perfect example because you had three young men. They were willing to die rather than to dishonor and disobey God. Many people are dishonoring and disobeying God because it's just convenience. Let's turn in our Bibles to Daniel 3 and let's read that. Daniel 3, 14, 18. And say amen when you have that. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known to, unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You know, you have to have the courage of God to make a kind of a statement like that, because even if you look here, who are all these people here? Notice these they're all kneeling. Many of these are what? Hebrews, right? From the church. They're kneeling, but these three said, no, we, they said, we don't want to go in the fiery furnace. This is what God, the power of God can do. And notice this. It says, in prophets and kings, as in the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so in the closing periods of earth history, that's the last days, friends, the Lord will do what? Work mightily in behalf of those who stand steadfastly for the right says, he who walked with the Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace will be with his followers wherever they are. Amen. We can take that promise. His abiding presence will comfort and sustain. And notice, in the midst of the time of trouble, trouble such as not been since there was a nation, his chosen ones, right, 144,000 here, will stand unmoved. Satan, with all the hosts of evil, cannot destroy the weakest of God's saints. Amen. Angels that excel in strength will protect them, and in their behalf, Jehovah will reveal himself as a God of gods, able to save to the uttermost those who have put their trust in him. So he's given us this promise that he's going to stand for us. So we, we can't be afraid if we're a member of the SDA club and they kick us out of the club, praise God because we're still a member of God's we're still a member of God's church if we are abiding with him, right? Just like the friends that I had they grew up with Amen. that were escorted out of the they had a police escort out of the church, right? Because they refused to stop 
They refused to stop quoting from the spirit of prophecy, so the pastor had the police escort them out. Are they still a member of God's church, yes or no? Yes, yes absolutely. So don't worry about your club membership. It doesn't mean anything unless we're in God's church and accounted as one of his faithful souls. And what a wonderful promise that God gives to all who refuse to uh, compromise their faith. He's going to save to the uttermost. It says all who put their trust in him. So we can't serve God and mammon. We must make our choice for the Lord today or risk losing everything anyway. We know that the trial and persecution is really going to come to all who, in obedience to God, refuse to worship on the false Sabbath, right? So we're preparing daily for these trials today by putting our total faith and trust in God. Because if we can't stand in the day of trial, if we don't pass the little test that God is giving us every day. Let's look at Romans 2.13. And we're going to compare the two groups again, the hearers and the doers. It says, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So all this means is that those who profess to know God, but they refuse to obey all his commandments, they're not justified. So we cannot use the commandments as a buffet to pick and choose which one we like and which one we don't and choose the ones we're, we're going to obey. You know, it's really an all or nothing proposition. So our profession of faith really is nothing without our works of obedience. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 29, 13. And I'm showing this foolishness on here because this is, these are all SDAs. They're doing what, the dance for Christ? No, this is not a dance for Christ, friends. It's a dance for Satan. And this is the foolishness that's going on in many of our churches here, the praise and worship competition. As my father used to say, what kind of foolishness is this in the house of God? Yeah, let, let me go on. <laughs> Notice Isaiah 29, 13. Wherefore, the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart from far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. And the responsibility lies with the church leaders and the pastors for, for this nonsense to go on in our churches, friends. We can't be sitting there and call this worship. It says, verse 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Friends, our works testify to our faith. We can't hide our works from God. He knows by our hearts, and he knows if we are truly his by our works, not by our profession, what we say, but by what we do. Look at this, letter 13. It is dangerous to be simply hearers of the word and not doers. He that hears and obeys every word that proceeds from the lips of God's building is building upon the rock. He that hears but does not bring the words of God into his life practice builds on the sand and will surely fall. Everything is to be shaken that can be shaken. It says everything. We shall realize this in our experience. So let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 7. Let's read verses 24 to 27. Matthew 7, we'll start with verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So the Bible tells us that the doers are compared to the wise man, and the hearers who did nothing are like the foolish man, just like the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. This is Signs of the Times, October 29th. 
Jesus compared the man who hears and obeys his words to the one who built his house upon a rock. And notice this underline, the floods of temptation may come and the tempests of trial beat, but he remains unmoved for his foundation is sure. And what is that foundation? It's Jesus Christ. But the man who built his house on the sand where it had no firm foundation, but was quickly undermined and overthrown. And notice what it says here underlined, fitly represents the one who hears the words of Christ and disregards them. Will we let this lesson impress our hearts and have an influence on our character building? We have to really ask, answer that question for ourselves. I mean, do we represent Christ? Are we actually building characters for eternity? If we are, then we have to put forth untiring and persevering efforts to subdue every sinful trait and to resist every temptation. So we can't waste the precious hours of probation that we have living for ourselves and, and our self-interest. If we are Christ's representatives on this earth, friends, then we have to do the works of Christ. We can't just talk about it. We have to do it. No one's going to enter heaven who is not a representative of Christ. Our lives, our characters, and our works have to represent Christ, friends. If we cannot remember the last time that we witnessed for Christ, if we can't remember the last time we put efforts to relieve someone else's burdens, if we can't remember the last time we gave out the gospel message and witnessing materials to somebody who might be hungry for the truth, if we can't remember the last time we visited someone to comfort them or to pray with them, or we can't remember the last time we ministered to somebody who was hungry or in need, I'm sorry, we're living for self. We have to live for Christ. We need to get busy working for Christ before it is forever too late. And I'm not talking about feeding or taking care of our own family, which we are already expected to do that as family members. I'm talking about doing the work that Christ gave us to do to get off the sidelines and go to work for the Lord. He's asked us to do this work in humble obedience for Christ and to do his will. And he's asked us to be co-laborers with him. So this is something he has asked us to do. And if we want to be enter the gates of heaven, we have to be a co-worker with him. There's no easy way to get there. We, there's no other way to do it. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 5 and let's read verse 14 to 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Notice verse 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If you're doing the works of Christ, People don't have to guess. They can see it with their eyes. They see what you're doing. They see how you're doing it. You know, we have the message of 100% truth. Why should we let the Jehovah's Witness who have maybe 10% of the truth go out there and outwork us? Amen. We don't need to let them do that. We have the truth, friends. This is Review, Review and Herald, February 14th. As we surrender our will to the will of God, as we humble our hearts before him, we shall earnestly desire to become co-laborers with him. So going forth to save those who perish. So if we want to be co-laborers with Christ, we want to have the desire, all we have to do is humble our hearts and give Christ our undivided service. And we will have that desire to be co-laborers with him. Friends, if, if we're expecting to be among those who are translated to heaven, then we have to be co-laborers with Christ. There's no other way to get there. This is what is required of us to build our characters for heaven. We have to deny self and we have to make every sacrifice for Christ's sake. We have to fully cooperate with God in the plan of salvation. If we don't cooperate with him, how can he help us? We have to refuse, if we refuse Satan's temptations, but we have to, if we refuse to wear Christ's yoke, then Christ says we have no part with him. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 11. Let's read verse 29 and 30. Verse 29, Take my yoke upon you 
and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Christ's yoke is easy, and his burden is light. So heaven is cheap enough, my friends. Can you think of anything here on planet Earth that would ever be worth exchanging for heaven? I can't. No, nothing. Let's look at this. Review and Herald. Again, earnest, untiring, persevering efforts must be put forth by who? Everyone who succeeds in building up a character for eternity. We may hear and believe the truth, but if we are not doers of the words of Christ, putting them into daily practice, we shall be like the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. So in other words, if we just come to church every Sabbath, say happy Sabbath, and then we're done for the week, that's, that's not going to work. We have to live Christ during the week and let others see that we are Christ's representatives. Christ is looking for workers in his vineyards because the workers are few. And we have to decide that we're going to be one of his workers. The, re the rewards, they so far exceed the sacrifice that we make for the cause of God that there's, there's really no comparison I mean, the time to build our characters for heaven is right now. We can't work after probation is closed. It's too late then. And soon the time will be over, friends. Let's turn to Matthew 16, 26, 27. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his what? His works. Christ says he shall reward every man according to his works. But how does this apply to the hearers and doers of today? So our prophet will explain to us in this way. If you are the means of gaining a soul from the ranks of Satan, you have gained other talents to your Lord. That soul you have been the instrument of saving in his or her turn can improve the talent given and the work moves onward. Notice what she says here in letter 11. Oh, how many who have done little or nothing for the salvation of souls or to benefit others will be disappointed to find they have no reward laid up in heaven. That's a very crucial statement because she says, oh, how many? So this is not a few. They were too slothful here to invest much in the truth and in the salvation of others. They sought their ease, their pleasure, shunned burdens and crosses and responsibilities. What she's saying is they, they just wanted the easy life. Yep, I said happy Sabbath, I'm done for the week. No. She's not talking, friends, that's not good enough. If, if I do not believe that anybody here wants to be a part of that second group, we all want to be part of the first group she talked about, who gained other talents for the Lord and received the gift of eternal life. Turn your Bibles to Romans. Let's read that. Romans 2, 6 and 7. Romans 2, verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his works to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life i like that part where it says by patience continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life you know very soon the latter rain is going to fall and the refreshing of the holy spirit and it's not going to fall on the slothful and the indolent but on those that were described in Romans 2, 7, who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory, honor, immortality, and eternal life. That means doing the work of Christ. We've all been warned about the ensnaring doctrine of faith without works, right? The pleasing fable that all there is to do is to believe has destroyed how many? Thousands and tens of thousands, she said, because many have called that faith which is not faith but simply a dogma. And underlying here it says, man is an intelligent, accountable being. 
He is not to be carried as a passive burden by the Lord, but is to work in harmony with Christ. That means he's truly a partner with Christ. And you'll know them by their works. Not by their words, by their works, right? Let's look at Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Christ gives us this warning again and again. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Notice the word doeth the will of my Father. Not talk about it, do it. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? In verse 22, who's he talking about? He's not talking about pagans or heathens, right? These are professed Christians in verse 22. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They were hearers of the word, but they were not doers. We must be co-partners with Christ. And then Christ will give us the increase. Notice, the work of gaining salvation is one of co-partnership, a joint operation. There is to be cooperation between God and the repentant sinner. If we start a business and we have a partner and we never show up to work, what's the partner going to say? How are you partners in the business? You don't. You never show up. We have to show up for work, friends. We have to be fully accountable to God. We have to fully cooperate with the powers of heaven. And it's truly a joint operation that Christ says. Because he says, without me, you can do nothing. So we have to have Christ in partnership with us. And I want to close with this promise. So please turn with me to 1 John 2, verse 15 and 7. I want to make sure everybody has this text. 1 John 2, 15 and 7. But please say amen when you're there. Notice verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes the way, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, abideth forever. Amen. And I want to say this is that we all want to be part of the kingdom of God, to meet our relatives, to meet our loved ones there. We want to be doers of the word, not just hearers. There's too many hearers and not enough doers. We want to get on the field of action and say, Lord, here am I, send me. And how many want to be co-partners with Christ in his vineyard? Amen. I'm glad. So let us all take this to heart and just go on to the field of action and God will send his holy angels to be there with us. Amen. Amen. Please join me as I close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have had mercy upon us to help us to get off the sidelines and go to work for the Lord to help us because you've kept the door of probation open just a little bit longer to give us time to get ready. We thank you for the little extra time that you've given us to be faithful to you. Help us to be counted worthy. Help us to use the talents that you've given us and multiply them. And I pray that we all here will be faithful stewards of the cross of Christ. And one day we will hear those wonderful, wonderful words that you say to us, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. And that is my prayer for each and every person here to help us to always be faithful. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.